Hello everyone, I'm Kim Aline, and today is Tuesday, April 16th. You are now watching Open, a program that brings the Bronx and New York City straight to you. Don't forget to stay connected with us via social media at BronxNet TV. Misdemeanors make up the majority of criminal cases filed in New York City. However, despite efforts to reduce unnecessary enforcement and promote more effective alternative responses, racial disparities in minor offense cases persist in New York City. Between 2016 and 2022, Black and Latino individuals accounted for nearly 50% of the city's population, yet they consistently represent over 80% of those charged with minor offenses. Senior Research Fellow for the NYU Brennan Center for Justice, Dr. Josephine Hahn, joins me to discuss. Doctor, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Kevin. Now, what motivated your team to conduct this research and why is it important to shed light on this issue? Yeah, we were funded by the MacArthur Foundation. Um, so a small team of Brennan Center researchers obtained seven years of non-public court data um, where we could dive into misdemeanors, violations, and fractions, meaning typically disorderly conduct, shoplifting, driving without a license, um, simple assaults, uh, to understand what was happening behind the numbers, particularly over the height of COVID in recent years. Now, were there any unexpected or particularly striking findings that emerged during the analysis process? I mean, as you encapsulated really well, um, misdemeanors actually comprise most of the criminal court system, which is widely unknown. 75% of cases involve these misdemeanors. Um, over 60% of them do not involve physical harm to a person. Um, and yet we saw massive declines in New York City to celebrate, over 50% declines in misdemeanors in particular, from over 200,000 cases in 2016 to just under 100,000 in 2022. And yet, um, as noted, racial disparities really remain the same. So we looked citywide, and when comparing our resident population to um, people with involved cases, we saw that black people had six times more likely um, than white people to have one of these minor offense cases. Now, I'm really glad that you also pointed out what those uh, offenses were, and mm -hmm. it could be something as little as driving without a license, maybe it could be expired. Uh, there's just so many uh, ways, and I think it really helps put it into perspective um, how minor these cases are, um, but how we, again, see that disproportionate effect of how it's affecting marginalized communities. How do these findings align with or challenge existing narratives or perceptions about the criminal justice system's treatment of marginalized communities? A lot of popular opinion and media coverage is about more serious crimes, so we wanted to shed light on the fact that these types of low-level offenses are really what drive our criminal system. And we did find, just in line with other studies in New York City and other places, that despite reforms, um, that racial disparities really remain the same or get worse. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, mm -hmm. Despite a decrease in absolute number of misdemeanor cases, why have racial disparities in enforcement remained consistent over the years, or as you mentioned, po possibly have gotten worse? There are a couple things we did to examine that. One, we scoped out of the criminal justice data into our neighborhoods. We tried to take a look at what neighborhoods, uh, what was happening in the neighborhoods with the most misdemeanor arrests. And it will not come as a surprise, but we found that most of the neighborhoods with the most arrests were largely low-income black and Latino communities in the South Bronx, in central Brooklyn, in East Harlem. Um, and they were, we saw higher levels of poverty, unemployment. Um, for example, in the South Bronx, some of the Neighborhoods like Mont Haven, Morrisania had um, poverty levels of over 55 to 66% of families were living on $55,000 or less. Um, the unemployment rates in the city were about 7.5. In these communities, they were double or more. Now, can you talk a little bit about, it's from 2016, I believe, to 2022. Mm -hmm. You know, what was the effect like um, when we had that little moment with COVID, you know, did we see any, did we see it go down? Did we see it go up? Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, that's a great question. So during COVID, we did see enforcement trends go way down. So where in all other years of the study, misdemeanors comprised about 75% of cases over COVID, we saw a steep decline um, and misdemeanors were about 68% of the cases and overall cases, case, um, criminal cases were quite low. And that was actually seen across the nation. Now, can you speak to any challenges or limitations encountered during the research process and how did your team address them? 
We always say that quantitative data is one particular type of knowledge and truth. We think it's really important to understand what's happening behind the numbers from the people that know best. So we also engage 166 stakeholders from law enforcement and the business community, nonprofit providers, local government officials, um, as well as, in, in particular, impacted black and Latino community experts who have um, witnessed and experienced the criminal system themselves. Now, beyond legal consequences, did the report examine any secondary impacts? Yeah, so we confirmed in our study, as seen in others, that the cases, most of them by 2022, ended in a dismissal, uh, but took a long time, about three to four months on average, even if they ended with no conviction. Um, and then when we were speaking to people across the range, we found a lot of common ground from law enforcement to impacted communities that these were driven by ongoing disinvestments in black and brown communities, um, lack of access to resources, which led to concentrated poverty, higher unemployment, um, lack of access to quality treatment for mental health and other health issues. I um, mean, these were really the drivers where constant and punitive only criminal justice responses really exacerbated, made worse all of these problems. Now, can you expand, you um, mentioned that a lot of them end in dismissal. Can you just um, expand like what that means and you know, what impact could this be having on you know the people affected by this? Right, that's a great question. So dismissal means that the case did not pass muster. There is no charge, no plea, um, and the case ends um, and are removed from the record. So even if cases uh, for misdemeanors, even with an arrest and even if they ended no conviction, they have lengthy and long-term consequences as seen in the research. Lost jobs, lost housing. I actually did a lot of observations right here in the Bronx Criminal Court, um, particularly around misdemeanor cases, and I saw a lot of the same directly around people really struggling with what are really poverty issues around addiction, lack of safe and affordable housing, lack of stable jobs, and these court cases made them worse. Now, what are some alternative responses to misdemeanor enforcement that have been found to be more effective? So what we heard from our stakeholders and in growing evidence, um, the research base and other studies were that there are promising approaches to reduce enforcement and continue to try to address these racial disparities that persist, including court alternatives in the system, especially on the front end. An example is Project Reset, which tries to resolve the course, uh, court case within the day um, with voluntary services and no other court involvement. Um, and we also heard a lot about the need for alternatives to behavioral health responses, both crisis, you know, in coordination with law enforcement, a co-response model, as well as non-enforcement models, which are piloting in here in New York City called Be Heard with trained um, medical professionals, as well as social workers who respond to behavioral health crises instead, also in coordination with law enforcement, of course. Um, we also heard about a lot of community alternatives, in including a model that's developed by the nonprofit Fountain House. That's a very um, person-centered approach where people decide um, and contribute to Clubhouse, the Clubhouse model. Um, and we also heard about the co-production of public safety needing to work across law enforcement and government and nonprofits, and especially our communities who know best what they need to build public safety in building up their physical infrastructure, um, their green spaces, their urban gardens, their uh, community events, you know, really leading the charge in what they need. I like to hear that there's also like redirection because I think that it's also re really important when we um, talk about racial disparity in the mm -hmm. criminal justice system. You know, I'm curious to know, we talked about the effect it could have on these individuals, but how does it affect the community at large? Um, and that could be, you know, children mm -hmm. um, all the way to senior citizens or elders. Absolutely. The effects are not just individual people struggling with lifelong consequences, but families and communities writ large. It really exacerbates the ongoing disinvestments, you know, strips people of access access to jobs and housing, and that goes often for their families as well. And we've been having, uh, just as a society, we've been talking about racial injustice, especially since, um, you know, what, you know, the protests, you mm -hmm. know, in 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some ways that, I guess, you know, throughout your research or maybe some of the community organizations you've worked with, that everyone can kind of um, try to at least help make a difference when it comes to racial disparities in the criminal justice system? That's a great question, Kevin, and a generational one. But the thing that always heartens me is that people on the ground in communities, community experts and leaders, as well as amazing community-based organizations are always, always working to build safety. 
it's really incumbent on and more criminal justice actors are really taking the charge to build these partnerships across systems in health and housing and also in the nonprofits and people that are building safety in their own communities. So, you know, check out the people that are doing the work, ask them what they need and how we can support and build partnerships. And that's what we try to do in research as well. Now, we got to talk a little bit before the interview and you told me a little bit about you know, the work that you do outside of this. I'm curious to know, you know, what actually drew you to this type of research? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I was a middle school teacher at a public school also here in the Bronx, a very um, well-resourced private school called Horace Mann. I also volunteered with the young people and their families in the juvenile justice system. Um, they're largely coming out of reentry and in Harlem. Um, and I really just saw what racism looks like um, when it's born by um, amazing and powerful black and Latino young people and their families and communities and um, tried to find solutions in partnership you know, ever since. Use research, use you know, what people are saying, all kinds of data and expertise to um, shine a light on real solutions to safety. Now, can you tell us a little bit more about the research you know, Brennan is doing outside of this? Sure, so we are definitely not just you know, keeping our research in these reports. We're setting up a lot of meetings with law enforcement. We're also building community workshops um, because we know that our experts both own the knowledge and expertise, but also know all of the things that are in our reports. So we want to build these workshops to make sure that we are um, giving back in mutual exchange um, and supporting their priorities and needs to build safety. And what do you hope to see for the future of this type of research? We've as I mentioned previously, over the years in any you know, field, whether it's medical, you know, criminal justice, mm -hmm. we've learned about racial disparities. What do you hope to see uh, be the overall outcome you know, following this type of research? Uh, a great question and a hard one. What I always want to see across all of the systems I worked in, ed education, public health, and criminal justice, is to really build equity approaches, which I do understand is, is generational work, um, with communities, impacted communities at the lead of this, to see these racial disparities lessen and disappear. Well, Doctor, I want to thank you so much for joining us. This was a really interesting and important conversation to have. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're constantly talking about racial disparities um, and facing it head on, because I think previously, uh, it was something that was in the background or something that we didn't want to address. So I'm so glad to see that your organization is really working to, you know, address this issue. So once again, I thank you so much for joining us and having this conversation. Thank you so much, Kibben, for having me. <laughs> if you would like to learn more about this report, please go to their website at www.brennancenter.org. Don't go away. We'll be back with more open after this.